So yes, um, the talk today refers to one of the um, threads in this book, the other 68, which you just mentioned, um, and that is about um, the role of the older generation and the role of generational conflict in social change. There's also other arguments in that book more about gender uh, conflict instead of generational conflict and that is what I will um, discuss next week in the, in the Christ meeting. Um, but um, if we look at the books and articles that historians will this work? Yes. usually produce on the German 60s, uh, the one common thread usually is that it is all about youth. And the actors that are center stage and that are on the covers are almost all uh, young, educated, middle class and male. So recent works, for example, by Norbert Frey or Wolfgang Krauser or Timothy Brown or Anna von der Goltz and many others tell a story whereby you have educated middle class students facing off against educated middle class professors and politicians. And typically in these words, the establishment of the old is a barely sketched out backdrop to a story that unfolds from the perspective of the young actors. And with the young or the so-called 68ers, I refer to those born roughly between 1938 and 1950. And just if we take one example, the most recent survey of um, German history, 20th century Germany by Ulrich Herbert, um, this has a 69-page chapter on the protests in the late 60s in West Germany. And of that chapter, um, 27 pages, so 40%, are on youth culture and youth protest. And youth is very finely differentiated in these pages according to gender, education, political affiliation, degree of radicalization, even the taste in music and fashion. In contrast, the over 60s get five sentences in this chapter. They stand for unswerving conservatism, authoritarianism, militarism, and sexual taboos. Um, we do not learn anything about their gender, class, religion, and politics. And indeed, we actually do know very little about West Germans over 60 at that time. And this is astonishing because historians tend to identify precisely these age groups born between 1890 and 1914 as, quote, the most important generation upon which the Nazi regime was built and which itself rebuilt the Federal Republic. And this, again, unquote, is a quote by Ulrich Herbert from this book. Scholars usually split this generation into two parts. The older cohort born before 1898 is often labeled the frontline generation, um, frontline generation of the First World War, and the following one, which is born between 1899 and 1914, is then called the war youth generation, a generation which was imbued with the spirit of toughness and uncompromising anti-Semitism. It supplied, according to Michael Wild and Thomas Kuhut and others, the youthful top elites of the Nazi regime. With a certain logic, historians then identify this latter war youth generation as the parents that the 68ers then ran up against in the late 60s. Much of the current historiography assumes that 60s protest in West Germany was mainly a generational conflict over the guilt of the fathers. Norbert Frey and Götz Ali contend the young assaulted, quote, the silent patriarchs of the Nazi elites, unquote, that, that's Götz Ali. Um, Well-known male protesters, for example, Bernhard Vesper, um, the son of the Nazi poet Will Vesper, um, and K.D. Wolf, the chairman of the West German SDS in 1968, are cited as prime examples of this conflict. Vespa and Wolf both maintained that they became rebels because of their Nazi father's refusal to talk about Nazi crimes. Such uh, late Oedipal scenarios of paternal repression are a reprise of traditional literary tropes going back centuries, so the Don Carlos myth, uh, I call that, um, um, because of Schiller. So there are several problems with this narrative of father-son son conflict. Firstly, the age cohorts don't always fit, or don't usually fit. 
In most families, the 68 er parents, in fact, were quite a bit younger than the war youth generation, having been born between 1908 and 1928. It was more often the grandparents than the parents who belonged to the most Nazified cohorts born before 1914. More importantly, the narrative also disregards female experience of mothers and daughters. It understands the young as active and the old as passive, and it takes for granted that the Nazi past was at the core of any conflict. It also Im implies, of course, that generational conflict was a widespread reality without actually establishing that. I want to call all these assumptions into question by approaching the long 60s, not just as a political battlefield, but as a period of transformative value change across all levels of society by widening the perspective, so to say. What was the role of the over 60s in 60s social change? What was their attitude to youth and consumerism? How did they relate to their children? And to what extent did the legacy of Nazism define their role? And I will um, try to answer these, question now, uh, these questions now in this talk. But to answer those questions, I needed to find new sources about the private and public lives of these over 60s. I need a testimony from the vast majority of aging people at the time, and by vast majority I mean those who were neither highly educated nor confined to care homes, um, because only about 4% of the over 60 population um, back then was, in, was frail and taken care of in care homes. And it was quite challenging to find such sources because autobiographies and diaries are typically written by the elites and early social science survey surveys were carried out mostly among the inhabitants of nursing homes during their last few years of life. And after a long search, I found my witnesses um, in a pile of about one and a half tons of files and magnetic tapes, some of which you can see here, in a dusty cellar at Heidelberg University. And these are the, re the remains of um, the so-called Bolsa. The Bolsa is um, the Bonn Longitudinal Study of Aging, and it was the first German large-scale gerontological study. Um, it ran from 1965 to 1984, um, first in Bonn and then in Heidelberg, and it was led by two professors of psychology. Oh, this is wrong. Yeah, whom you can see actually on this picture, um, Hans Thome and Ursula Lehr. Um, in the background there, they're listening to one of the interviewees of the Bolsa reciting a poem on a trip that was part of this, um, this uh, study design. Um, now the Bolsa was built on extensive, repeated one-to-one -one interviews of 222 old men and women. And this is the interview situation here. And um, in the little red circle in the middle there, you see microphones because all these interviews were taped on magnetic tape uh, recorders. And each subject came to Bonn every two to three years um, until their death. And each time they were there, they left about 10 hours of recorded conversation. So we have about 3,000 hours of taped interviews all in all. So these are my witnesses. Um, I decided to call them Bolzacs um, <laughs> <laughs> because it was easier to say than those people who participated and so on. Um, and so the Bolzacs came from... Oops. From the areas shaded in green of this map of West Germany at the time. Um, so they lived in and around the Rhineland, the Ruhr and the Frankfurt region. Uh, two age groups were recruited, one born between 1890 and, uh, and 1895, and the other one between 1900 and 1905. So therefore, these groups correspond to the so-called frontline generation and war youth generation. The subjects came um, from the lower and lower middle classes, um, and here are some of their faces. Um, and these tapes are a sensational find because they are by far the earliest recorded life story and biographical interviews of ordinary West Germans that we possess. Uh, oral history projects in West Germany only began about 20 years later in the mid-1980s. On these tapes, old men talk about war experiences, falling in love, poverty, being bullied, 
old women talk about marriage problems, abortions, hunger, politics. And analyzing the balsam means engaging with thousands of such stories, but also, of course, with the handwritten notes of the interviewers um, and with the way that these psychologists made sense of their um, study findings. And w their study design was mostly about quantitative, it was mostly quantitative analysis, um, questions about longevity, for example, or the decline of intelligence um, in, during the process of aging. Um, it's quite fascinating how this team around the psychologists Tome and Lea designed the study and interpreted the findings, but I don't really have time to go into this now, so you can ask later. Um, so these, these men and women of the Bolsa were between 60 and 75 years old when the interviews began in 1965. And the younger of the two age groups had had their children roughly between the mid-1920s and the mid-1940s. Only a small group was parent to 68 or children. Most were already grandparents of teenagers and twins. And so in these families, we typically find three generations. We find the old Balzacs, the grandparents, then the middle-aged parents and the young. And thus, um, if we generalize this finding, the young protesters of the late 60s did not usually face off against one older generation, but against two generations, a middle generation and, an, and a grandparent generation. But if we go back to the perspective of the over 60s now, um, so what was the relationship of these Balzacs to their grown children and grandchildren? Practically all of them enjoyed uh, durable, closely knit relations with their children and grandchildren. Old and young typically lived apart, but their households were not far from each other. They sought independence, the older people sought independence, while helping each other regularly in everyday life, financially and emotionally. This pattern is unsurprising because it goes back centuries and it has been termed intimacy at a distance by the sociologists um, Leopold Rosenmeier and Eva Köckeis in 1965 already. Of our sample in 1965, only 10% shared the same household with their children. Um, for 60%, the children lived less than an hour away. For an additional 30%, they lived in a separate household in the parents' house. The old people decidedly rejected moving in with their children because they cherished, they cherished their independence. They didn't want to become a burden on them and they did not want to become too involved in their children's day-to-day -day worries either. 78% rated their relationship with the children as excellent. Two-thirds saw their children at least twice weekly, 43% even daily. Every second Balzac owned a phone and at least 70% um, of those used the phone regularly or frequently. And only 1.8% um, had lost contact with their offspring. Now I'm just presenting you with a few findings of the original study team here. Um, so um, this, these are numbers taken from a dissertation by one of the interviewers, Maria Renna, who's in the picture here. And the median rating of happiness with the parent-children relationship is very high, 7.63 on a scale of 1 to 9. And likewise, the emotional involvement of Balzacs with their children is extremely strong. And here you have a scale of, one to, uh, of 0 to 6, and the median is 5.42. And what's interesting here, that it's even more important to them how their children are doing than how their partner was doing. Um, this closeness between the generations is also underpinned by money flows. In West Germany, pensioners' incomes begin to rise quite substantially from 1957 onwards. And this is um, the payout of pensions in December 1957 here. That year, the Adenauer government, uh, the conservative government of the time, passed the so-called dynamic pension law. And this law tied pensions to rising wages and the rates of inflation. And therefore, overnight, old age poverty, which had been the norm, became relatively rare. The elderly became less dependent on their adult children, and in fact, they now began to regularly hand out money to the young. Um, 
Cash injections for the young became central to intergenerational relationships from 1957. They typically enabled adult children to build a house, pay for a holiday or buy nice clothing for the grandchildren. The Bolsa team stated that their subjects, quote, greatly enjoyed being able to channel their affection into cash gifts, unquote. Typically, the young uh, recipro reciprocated by, by assisting with everyday chores. Sons helped with home repairs and renovation, gardening and lugging heavy items up, up, up the stairs. Daughters washed curtains and windows, cleaned the stairs and shopped for groceries. Hands-on help by the old for the young was much more limited and it was usually restricted to a short period of a few years during which the grandchildren were babies and toddlers. The, the psychologist's summary was that, quote, the principal domain, domain of, par of parental assistance is financial, unquote. So as the elderly had this money to dispose of, what was their attitude towards mass consumerism? There are social science surveys from the mid-60s which stress that old and young partnered up to master mass consumerism together. And allegedly, according to these studies, parents welcomed the, uh, the affluent society and relied on their children to guide them in this brave new world of bewildering choices. A look at the Balzacs challenges this impression. They hardly ever report expensive purchases for themselves. Um, they also didn't regularly uh, seek their offspr offspring's advice on consumer decisions. Only 17% of them owned a car, another 30% were regularly driven about by their children. While the over 60s often gave their children money towards buying a car or furniture, in many cases they felt afterwards that the money hadn't been well spent. The only major consumer good that old and young could fully agree on was owning a home often built from scratch with parents and children chipping in jointly. Generally, we have the elderly embracing thrift and criticizing their offspring for um, extravagance. Um, Herr Erbs, for example, says, my daughter needs more money to run her house than my wife. Herr Weider states, today's youth lives in the land of plenty and he lays into his daughter for spending beyond her means. Praise is lavished on those daughters and wives who display modesty and self-sufficiency, sewing their own clothes, growing their own vegetables. Um, indeed, the majority of the over 60s emphasize self-sufficiency to the extent that they are wary of tinned food. 70-year-old Frau Tyler gets her vegetables from her garden and her meat from her sister. Herr Zule keeps rabbits and hens for meat and eggs. Herr Boer slaves in his vegetable garden four hours daily. And on autumn days, 70-year-old Herr Übel gets up at dawn to forage for blackberries um, and reports that he gets 75 kilos a season. <laughs> so, so as we see, it really was the middle generation of parents that discovered mass consumerism together with the young. The grandparent generation kept their distance from con consumerism. The ethic of the over 60s was to work, save, build a home and be self-sufficient. And here's a list of their hobbies. Um, their leisure time was filled typically with reading the paper, taking walks, having chats and gardening. They rarely engaged in window shopping, traveling or listening to records activities that would have required active participation in mass consumerism. Clearly, these old people do not conform at all to today's neoliberal image of active, mobile, consumerist and entrepreneurial young old. So, and what did the elderly think of youth in general? Um, and of youth conflict at the time in the late 60s. In 1967 and 68, all these bald sacks were interviewed in much detail about their stance toward today's 16 to 20 year olds. And their responses were then compared with the control group, uh, which was between 33 and 58 years of age, so the middle generation. Indeed, the old subjects criticized youth much more strongly than the middle aged. And here's another table from one of the 
um, psychologist involved with the Bol Bolsa, Helga Merkel. Um, and you see here that while the middle-aged and the aged both object to the young social conduct by over 80%, the elderly were particularly harsh on appearance, long hair, beards, jeans, um, and they were particularly harsh also on public displays of affection. And that's not really the case anymore with the middle generation, which is much more neutral towards this. Interestingly, though, those elderly who most sternly and stereotypically reprimanded today's youth were not the same ones who were locked in conflict with their own offspring. In the Bolsa interviews, strong criticism of today's youth mostly referred to the abstract concept of youth. Those young people one met on the street on, and in, the tra in the tramway, not the young within one's own family. Um, at the same time, the Balzacs were tested on their attitude to changing parenting styles. And um, here we have a clear pattern by which th the strictness of one's upbringing diminishes from one generation to the next. The elderly overwhelmingly report having been brought up very strictly and raising their own children somewhat less strictly. But then they criticized their adult children for being even less strict. Fully 40% of the Balzacs openly disagreed with their children's parenting style, but crucially, most chose not to admonish their sons and daughters in this respect, as they feared that this could backfire and poison the family bonds. So intergenerational harmony within families is achieved by, by strategic restraint on the part of the old. And this method, actually, this strategic restraint, in order to preserve the relationship is employed by the old and the young during that time. If the traditional pattern of intimacy at a distance served well to diffuse conflict, so did a post-1945 pattern that I term intimacy through silence. <laughs> As a rule, the young and the old in families refrained from speaking about the Nazi crimes and personal guilt. None of the 222 Bolsa subjects reported discussing the Nazi past with their children. Moreover, the young psychologists who worked with the Balzacs, many of whom themselves belonged to the 68er generation and whom I interviewed recently, were also typically not keen to broach the topic with their own parents or with their interviewees, to whom they had built up a personal relationship as an interviewer. Intimacy through silence was at work in families as well as in the Balsa study environment where the team consciously tried to avoid talking about the subject's involvement with Nazism. So there were some families in my sample where clashes between the old and the young existed. And clearly, such cases were the exception. 70% of parents were highly satisfied, only 12% were rather dissatisfied, and 3% very dissatisfied with the relationship to their children. And I looked a bit more into those cases of conflict. And a statistical analysis brings some surprises because disappointment with this parent-child relationship significantly correlates with two factors only, car ownership and refugee background. And so that means those who lacked access to a car couldn't see their children as frequently as they wished, which left them more dissatisfied. And the same held for those who had immigrated from East Germany or the lost provinces in the East, and they had adult children, often who had stayed behind and now were trapped behind the Iron Curtain. And there also comes some dissatisfaction from that. The patterns of conflict suspected by historians, male politicized students confronting their fathers about the Nazi past, are not at all borne out by the sample. Fathers were no more often at odds with their children than mothers, and disagreements over the Nazi past um, wasn't mentioned once. And in any case, open conflict was very rare. I closed in on a subset of 26 of my 222 cases um, in which Balzacs reported particular unhappiness in the parental role. Eight of these were distraught because they were childless, uh, four were affected by the death or severe mental illness of a child. <clears throat> and these cases cannot really count as generational conflict, so we are left with 14 families. And of these, we have open conflict in eight cases. That's a mere 3.6% of our sample. 
and while in the other six the parents voiced their criticism only in the interview situation. So what was the strife about? Most often parents objected to the choice of marriage partners, nine times. Rose about money exacerbated the disagreements five times. And in only three cases each, parents argue with their own sons or respectively daughters. Much more often they clashed with the son-in-law or the daughter-in-law. There was no particular pattern about fathers and sons. While sons and, da and daughters were most lo uh, loudly scolded for marrying the wrong person, sons were also accused of aiming too low in their careers and daughters of neglecting their household duties. Politics in the widest sense was only mentioned once as a point of disagreement. And here is our one cantankerous Nazi father. I think he can qualify as that. His name is Herr Odermann. And he was a teacher who in 1965 still proudly declared that he marched in the first row and that Hitler, quote, was not a criminal and just not really German enough, unquote. <laughs> After the war, uh, Herr Odermann spent a year in an American internment camp and then he spent another five difficult years as a lumberjack and store man. And he only made it back into teaching in 1951 with a little help of former party members. And now he argued with his daughter because she had rented out a room to a Jordanian student and to Herr Odermann all Arabs were communists, just like the Jews. Of course Herr Odermann was not the only Nazi and anti-Semite in our sample. There were quite a few Balzacs who had held major posts or firm Nazi convictions during the Third Reich. On the tapes, between 20 and 27% of the men confessed to Nazi party membership, Nazi beliefs, or Nazi crimes without having been asked about it. But none of these men, save Herr Odermann, dared to go to battle with their children about politics. They also did not openly confess to their Nazi views among their contemporaries, being well aware that they risked to be ostracized. The typical pattern with the old Nazis was that they avoided talking politics and only vaguely referred to their past, if at all. Most of them had been impacted temporarily by de denazification measures after 1945 and had been reinstated in their jobs after a few years uh, and forced uh, pause. But the years that they had lost from their careers and the downgrading of their position at the point of re-entry had dented their confidence and lowered their pension payments. Most old Nazis felt discredited enough to uh, adapt quietly to the new times and their family relations were usually harmonious. There is even a pattern by which the most tainted Balzacs turned towards family life as they turned away from politics. In the words of one retired accountant who regretted his involvement with the Nazi party, Quote, in, in 1945, that was the big drawback. I had to start from scratch. Then in 1946, I drew a line under all of it, and now I only live for my family. Unquote. In sum, what does the Balsa tell us about the 60s in West Germany? Contrary to the widespread picture of generational clashes, we see that families at the time experience an unusually high level of generational harmony. This finding fits with opinion polls from the late 60s and 70s in which 8 or 9 out of 10 young people consistently attested to having good relations with their parents and rejected the catchphrase, don't trust anyone older than 30. The reasons for this increase in generational harmony are first diminishing financial dependence of the old on the young and second intensified contact due to the spread of cars and, and telephones. In the few cases where open conflict erupts, it is likely to be about marriage partners and money and to be fought out with the children-in-law instead of one's own children. The, the supposedly typical clashes between fathers and sons are exceedingly rare and mostly not about politics. Coincidentally, this new picture of relative generational harmony within families fits well with uh, other recent research projects on young activists and on family memories of the Nazi past. Um, in 2007 to 2011, um, a team led by Robert Gildear toured Europe to interview hundreds of former 60s activists 
And this team found that the idea of generational conflict had great traction in the narratives of the young, but crucially was not mirrored in the interviewee's own family pasts. Whereas the activists constructed their life stories against the parents' generation, their rebellion was against abstract parents rather than their actual ones. Many young activists came from leftist non-conformist families and had even attended their first demonstrations jointly with their parents. As the team concluded, quote, however firmly the notion of generational conflict may be established in popular memory, many activists in Germany and elsewhere did not experience such a conflict in their own families, unquote. The second research context concerns the communication of, na of the Nazi past within German families. A team led by Harald Welzer interviewed 43 generation families in 1998 and discovered widespread mechanisms by which young and old jointly blurred and sugarcoated the details of the elder's Nazi past. While the young knew, knew the abstract facts about the Nazi crimes and the Holocaust, they simply could not imagine that Opa and Oma, the loving grandparents, might also have been perpetrators. The family memory exonerated the older generation, while public communication about the Nazi past did just the opposite. We encountered the same disconnect between the spheres of the family and the public in the society of the 60s, where young people publicly, conf uh, publicly confronted the older generation about their role uh, in Nazism, it was in public settings, at universities, at schools, in courtrooms. Students leveled sweeping accusations against authority figures that they were not related to. Professors, teachers, judges, and politicians. Publicly, the reference to the Nazi past became a ubiquitous instrument in political battle. Thus, Red Army faction terrorist Gudrun Enslin attacked the older generation at large and said, quote, you can't talk to people who created Auschwitz, unquote. But Enslin, just as the Ulrike Meinhof or the Communards Rainer Langhans and, uh, Langhans and Fritz Teufel, came from a loving family relatively untainted by Nazism. Contrary to Enslin's assumption, almost nobody evoked the specter of Auschwitz within the walls of the family home. In private, both the young and the old draped jointly a blanket of silence over the Nazi past, so as not to upset the precious relationship between parents and children. Clearly, the 60s saw two types of generational relations that operated on separate levels. There was the level of public debates and politics, where contemporaries witnessed acrimonious clashes between the young and the old. And then there was the familial level, where the generations lived in relative harmony with each other. The reasons for this historic increase in familial harmony were the increasing affluence of pensioners and the patterns of intimacy at a distance and intimacy through silence. Historians of the 60s need to distinguish much more clearly between the concepts of familial generations and political generations. The concept of political generations, which goes back to sociologist Karl Mannheim's theory from 1928, is, I think, overused by historians, particularly with respect to modern German history. Too often political generations are taken as factual entities when they are no more than retrospective constructs by contemporaries or scholars. Only if we keep familial and political generations apart will we be able to move beyond a black and white picture pitting progressive sons against reactionary old men. In the 60s, the construct of generational conflict typically was a, a political weapon rather than a feature of individual and family biographies. And elsewhere, I have argued that generational conflict has been overstressed and gender conflict downplayed in our narrative of 60s protest. And this, I suspect, is a pattern of 60s protest that applies well beyond the realm of West Germany. Thank you.